You're listening to the Based on History podcast. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives. But they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Howdy everybody, welcome back to another mini of Weapons, Armor, and Tactics. Joining me again is my brother for the continuation of the Kingdom of Heaven series that that we've done. And we're going to do some of the weapons, some of the armor, and then just a little bit of the tactics that you'll see in the Kingdom of Heaven, as well as what they were using in that time as well. And like I always say, we're not going to hit every single weapon every single piece of armor, every single battle tactic that these armies or people would have been using. I just like to pick a few each movie to highlight. And the next medieval movie we do, I'll pick a few more weapons. And you know, just like in the, in the tombstone one, I didn't pick every single gun. I just picked a few that I like. So this one, we're going to uh, talk about just a few of the crusader weapons and a few of the the Saracen weapons and then, you know, kind of jump back and forth between the two as we go down the list. So the we'll start with the Crusaders and their weapons. And the first one I wanted to talk about is the Lance. The the really the what they emphasized in their battle that really gave them the edge over other armies was their heavy heavy cavalry. And they were they would have carried swords and daggers and things you know or a mace or an axe or something like that as a secondary weapon but what the knight on horseback is charging into battle with is a battle lance it is a heavy piece of timber i mean think of it kind of like a jousting lance it's going to be heavy and they're going to have some type of metal point on the end i mean maybe not a metal point but it's going to come to a point it's not going to be dull on the end and the European cavalry was just different than Eastern cavalry, and they both have their advantages and disadvantages. But the lance is, is going to be the main offensive weapon of the charge because what one thing you can't do as much as movies make it seem like in in a charge is continually just swing your sword over and over and over again, and the lance allows you to extend your reach. To, to focus, think about this, the, the, the lance is the combined energy of the human and the horse traveling at speed being focused onto a really small point. That is a lot of energy and power that the lance carries. And when you're hitting a line, you are able to, I mean, not only is the horse trampling and pushing people over and all that stuff, but the lance allows you to keep people at bay Keep the charge moving while you have an offensive weapon that can basically just keep plowing, plowing through people. It is, and you do see it, you do see it, but in the movie, you don't really see the lance. Like in the, in the cavalry battle, they're carrying some, I mean, like I said, some of them are, but not, not the main guys. The main guys are all carrying swords. In real life, they would probably be carrying lances. Right. You see some of the, some of the. Muslim cavalry has spears. Spears, right. Um, but yeah, if, if all you have is swords, you kind of take away the power of the charge. Right. You ride up, and then you hack with your sword. The whole, that's the whole point of the lance, is that you can throw all that energy in at something. Mm-hmm. And without it, you just don't have much of a charge anymore. No, yeah. I was like, once you stop to hack somebody, the charge is done. Then you're just a... Just fighting from horseback. Just fighting from horseback. Yeah. Which, I don't get me wrong, it has its advantages as well. But um, the whole point of the charge is to move formations. The whole point of the charge is to move formations or, or break them in some way, shape, or form. And it is all, it's all about momentum, which is one of the things that the light horse archers try to negate with their tactics and things of that nature. But 
like so you, the biggest example I can give is Lord of the Rings, right? At the Battle of Pelennor Fields when the Rohirrim is running down the orcs, they're they have to keep that momentum, and there are too few spears in the Rohirrim <laughs> in my in my opinion. They're all carrying axes and swords, and and they're not carrying. There are zero lances, and it just it would have petered out because they are swinging and swinging and swinging and you just can't maintain that same type of inertia momentum with a sword that you can right. with a lance. And the horse could still keep running, but just from the the a fight ability, it's not going to be the same. Right. And horses there for a long time there was kind of this idea that if if infantry like held firm in a line, horses simply would not run into them. Yeah, that's not true. And that's not true. Like right. it's true that horses would rather run between people than into them. Mm-hmm. But the 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 idea that horses simply will not charge infantry in a line, that has pretty much been broken as a myth. Oh, like the, yeah. ho- horses will charge into to people. Yeah. Um, but again, it's whereas again the Lord of the Rings example, right? Horses will not just make humans melt away. No, I mean, they right. can't just charge through thousands of humans like they're like they're not even like it's grass, right? Um, but they, they they will plow over lines, but. You cannot run through the entire formation uh, right. of a army. The other thing that Lord of the Rings gets wrong is that, like, there are many, many, many account. Like, horses are big, strong animals. Like, if one arrow doesn't kill a human, one arrow is not going to kill a horse unless it hits it, like, you know, in a strategic area. Right. There are many accounts of horses running through battle lines. They've got like 10, 12 arrows, and and the horse doesn't die. Right. right. I mean, like, yes, it's wounded and they take care of it, and maybe some of them do die eventually. But in Lord of the Rings, one arrow hits a horse and it just like completely crumples right. and falls. But then they hit the lion; they're invincible. So it's like you got it's like this big drastic right. shift. Like one arrow kills them, but then once they hit the lion, they plow through them like you said, like they're grass. It's just it's in between, like you know. Right. Right. And also, horses, although horses are very sure footed animals. They trip and fall. When you're running over body after body after body after body, it horses fall. Horses are going to fall. They slip. Yeah, I mean, on grass, they... Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been on horses that have slipped and, and, and fallen, and it's scary. But that that's, we're kind of getting into more tactics now. But we'll just move on. And the next one I want to talk about is, is the spear, but mainly from an infantry perspective. When you watch movies, and I think I've said this before, but when you watch movies... The most overrated slash overused weapon you see is the sword. The spear is the like, the spear is the the weapon of choice. Certainly for the infantry or for the common man. Yes, yeah, and nobility. Now, although they would not carry a spear, the spear is. I mean, the lance is like a is right. It, is it fills a, that role. It for them. Yes, thank you. It fulfills that role for them. Yeah, but. And although, like, sergeant-at-arms would carry swords and, you know, th- things like that. And even dismounted knights are going to carry swords. But a dismounted knight would probably be carrying some type of pole arm, like a halberd or right, a duckbill. Right. Or... Certainly as you get later in medieval times. Right. The sword is like your backup last resort it, it's weapon. A, it's a sign of authority, right. really. And, yes, obviously the sword the sword's kind of like a jack-of-all-trades weapon. You can hack, slice, and penetrate. But it, it's not – there are things that do all of those things better. Right. And, yeah, this at this time period, they're still in mail, so the sword is a little bit more effective as far as penetration is concerned than when you get into, like, metal plating and, and you know, cuirasses and, and things of that nature. But the spear is, even, even to, like, gunpowder times, the spear is still an effective weapon for a non-nobility army to carry. And so, like, when... And you do see it when, like, Jerusalem sh- shows up to carry. There are a ton of spears. Right. But I just want to emphasize the fact that, like, how widespread the spear would be compared to the sword. Right, and almost any medieval army, certainly like in, in Europe where it's a lot of infantry, the most common weapon being carried was spears pretty much through the entire medieval era. You know, like you said, dismounted knights are carrying halberds and, and brown bills and things like that that can hook and smash and bat or maces that can really get through the good right. armor. But the average guy has a spear because things that use a lot of metal like swords are expensive mm-hmm. and things like halberds and, and some of that other, other weapons they're complex to make right. I mean it's you don't just have one in your shed it, and it a spear is a stick with yeah. a small sharp piece of metal at the end. Yeah. And, and anyone can have that I was like, and 
like I, there's whole arts of spear fighting. I watched a video of this guy talking about like the art of spear fighting and stuff like that. But when you're fighting in formation, you do not need the spear fighting like art form right, you to don't be have to spin it over your head. Right, exactly. Like you don't have to be Brad Pitt and Troy <laughs> to be an effective fighting soldier in a, in an army. Like a a commoner in a army with a spear and basically no armor could kill a king on a horse with a spear. And this or knight, you know, knight has years and years of training. And, and like we talked about armor and how it saves them and stuff like that. But my, my point is like you can take people who have no fighting experience and they can be an effective fighter. Right. And all you've done is give them a spear and, and a shield. And a shield. Tell them stand in line. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like the spear is the unsung hero of not only the ancient and medieval but all through. And the la- the last one I want to talk about for the Crusaders is is the mace. And another thing that like swords replace every weapon in movies, right? Right, right. Because they're, they're so noble looking mm. and they're so romanticized and they're cool, right? And they and they're cool. They look great. Yeah, maces and are not exactly romantic weapons. No, even sp- the blood- spears kind of, but not right. really. It's it's a bludgeon. It's a blunt force trauma weapon, right? And you see, you see the mace come more into play when more plate armor is coming in because you can damage organs without having to actually get, pen, yeah, get penetrate anything. You can plate. break bones without having to penetrate the armor and things like that. But you do see uh, Balian does use the war hammer mm-hmm. in one scene. He loses his sword and he grab. He uh, no, he doesn't lose his sword. Uh, he does lose his sword, but not the scene I'm talking about. He's walking by and he pulls a war hammer out of somebody else's belt when he's on the when he's on yeah. the wall. He like pats his back too. He's, yeah, he's, he's like, hey, I'm he's taking like, your hammer. Yeah, thanks, bud. <laughs> thanks, bud. Uh, which is cool because you don't see uh, you don't see war hammers that often. Now uh, Mel Gibson does use a war hammer at the beginning of the Battle of yep. Sterling, but you just don't see them all that often. Well, the the squire guy we mentioned who m- must have died when the ship goes down. Oh yes, he uses a hammer in yeah. the forest. So he uses an not an arming sword. What's the he has a, like a falchion. A falchion. He yeah. uses a falchion and a warhammer. And a warhammer, which so, is cool. Two weapons you don't see yeah, often. That's often. The, yeah, Not all swords are beautiful, double-sided, yep. knightly arming swords. Yep, There's the, a the, lot of single-edged swords in medieval Europe. Yep. You never see them in movies. No. The, the, I thought, when I was young, I thought he had like a, a Saracen sword. Right. Yeah, like because a centaur, I, Yeah, because I, I didn't know what a falchion was when I was mm-hmm. younger. And then I went on and I, I saw it. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I mean, it's basically a peasant sword because it's done out of like a machete type metal. You know, like it's for chopping. It's got that heavy bulge at the end, so it lends to the chopping. You know, right. fighting uh, mechanism or whatever you want to call it, style. Um, but yeah, the mace and warhammer esque bludgeoning weapons, especially from a defensive standpoint of being able to hit somebody as they're coming up, and and you can just waylay. You can just you know yeah. go. Mad mad dog on him. <laughs> Especially a man wearing mail. I mean, swords, swords. yes, you can stab with swords. Again, Hollywood's made us think that swords go through armor like butter. Right. It's pretty hard to stab your way through armor. And there's a good chance you're going to be slashing or bashing. Well, a sword blade doesn't go through heavy mail when no. you slash it. Right. That's kind of where mail really comes into its own is preventing slashes. Mm-hmm. And so... If the the sword wearing, becomes a bludgeoning weapon because you're breaking bone. Right, but it's that, too but it's too light to be a very good one. Right, and so when you're wearing flexible mail, someone with a hammer or mace can just smash you through it. You know, I mean, it's like think of if if someone had a thick quilt on and you were you were kind of hitting them with a stick from the side versus hitting them with a hammer. You know, it might kind of a thin stick from the side might sort of a blanket might kind of repel that. It's not stopping a hammer, no, right? right? Or a baseball bat, right? Or a bat, yeah, a big heavy <laughs> item that can just hit it regardless of, of whether it breaks through it it's just gonna smash yeah. it and, and they're straight through it. they're strong enough to parry a sword a sword oh uh, yeah yeah swords yeah. don't cut through wood like like they do I mean in movies yeah. right exactly I mean they've they've done those testing I mean of like swords aren't as effective as people think they are right. you can watch pretty much any YouTube video out there of them testing different things and right. stuff like that. And the sword's never as effective as as, no. as it's portrayed. Nah, they just look cool. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, and there's the rule of cool applies sometimes. Yes. Right. Yeah, when you're trying to sell movie tickets. Right. Instead of weapons. Because <laughs> the, the Eblin sword's awesome. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, Orlando Bloom's main sword, yeah. It looks, yeah, the, it looks super cool. Yes. I used to draw it. Like, try, <laughs> like when I would draw like a knight, I would always try and make that sword. Uh, super cool. But anyway, now we'll move on to kind of the Saracen... Muslim weapons and things like that, and the 
the bit I mean like the big one difference between like you know heavy cavalry lance is going to be the light horse archer that the Turks brought in that pretty much conquered the you know the uh, Fatimid Empire or Fatimid excuse me uh, Empire because they're a slow mobile lesser version of the European armies and then these Turk horse archers are highly mobile they're well supplied with arrows and as we've seen throughout history right from the Huns going up against the Western Roman Empire and the Byzantines to later on when the Mongols you know come in to the Scythians you know versus in the Parthians and some of that this horse archer combo when it can be focused can be very powerful it's when it's disorganized is when they don't they're basically raiders but when they can be focused is when you can see them do some major major damage because not everyone else is like that right so when you're fighting something that's completely different it causes a bunch of, of challenges especially from a mobile mobile standpoint right when it's well led well coordinated and you have space for it right i mean there's, there's kind of a reason no horse archer cultures ever popped up in western europe <coughs> It's because Europe is a is a place of woods and you know right. mountains and I mean there are open areas in Europe but again these horse archer cultures almost all at, for, at some point in their in their lineage came out of Central Asia right yeah I mean whether you're looking at the how are you saying Scythians or Scythians the mm -hmm. Parthians the Magyars the Huns the Avars the right. Bulgars the Mongols you go on and on and on them the Manchus I mean they all some some way have a connection almost universally. To Central Asia, yeah. you know, and you look at areas of the world where I mean, they had horse it's, archers. It's a grassland that's the size of the United States, right? <laughs> and you, look, you look at parts of the world that had horse archers that weren't Central Asia. Like it's almost always the descendants of people that came out of Central Asia. Yeah, and the the only other place that you really really see it is in the United, like in the Americas, like with the Indian tribes. And where do you find the horse archers on the Great Plains? Yeah, the Great Plains, yeah. Right. The Iroquois didn't become horse. No, archers. yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. The, yeah, I was just about to say that the Iroquois didn't ride horses or shoot arrows like the Comanche and the Sioux right. and the Cheyenne did. So, and that's that's why that style work, where it worked a little, even though Middle East is not Central Asia. When they went there, it is more open than Europe, right? right? And so, right. That's why it works there. That's why you saw those cultures come and, and dominate and. We saw Turk, various Turkish dynasties set up all kinds of kingdoms across mm -hmm. it. And when you... And I'm going on to the next weapon of theirs that you really see. And this is... You can... In, in the movies, in Hollywood movies, this is... And I get why they do it, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily bashing it, because weapons are widespread throughout, right? The different weapons, different here, different person, whatever. But you can identify them just by the weapons. The Crusaders have long swords. Right. They're and straight. They're straight. And the Saracens have, you know, scimitars. Right. right? Or, or some type of curved saber. Mm -hmm. And to some degree that is true because different cultures have different weapons and, it's, uh, you know, varying the, the history of the development of weapons. We could get into that too. But there are straight double-edged Saracen swords. There are, they have their version of the long sword, right? They have their version of the war hammer. They, but... It is very identified as that you see in the U.S. Marine Corps. They call it the Mamluk sword, mm -hmm. but it, you know it, it's skinny at the hill and it tapers, 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 and it's got that fat belly. Right. You know, varying degree of a fat belly, getting close to the point, so that it builds up energy whenever they're they're coming down right. with it. And that and, that Mamluk sword that the Marines carry, mm -hmm. a Mamluk was a Turkish slave yeah. soldier. <laughs> That's what a Mamluk was. Now they they created a dynasty in Egypt, which is where. The Mamluks right, usually right. refers to, but a Mamluk was a Turkish slave soldier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, even again, you see more evidence for, for the scimitar being that sort of right. you know Turkish weapon of choice. And then the, the last weapon that we're going to talk about with the you know Muslim forces is the composite bow. And it, at this point in time, it's really interesting because now obviously the Europeans had bows, and even when you go back in time the Europeans have recurve bows. The Romans used recurve bows, right? It's not just the Mongols. Everyone talks right. about just the Mongols or the steppe people. Right. They're the only ones that had this. So like, no, the Europeans used recurve bows. Yep. And, but... Middle Pre-Muslim pre Middle Eastern cultures used composite recurve yeah, yeah. You know, Egyptians right. and Syrians. That's yes. where the Romans got some of their best archers from were Syria, yes. be long before the Turks came. Yeah, so, so the, the recurve bow is not just a Mongol invention, but... The one thing I think is interesting is that when you think of European medieval archers, there's one bow and one bow only that you think of, and that's the English longbow. <laughs> right. And, right. And, when, and I talked about this in the Braveheart episode, is that 
most the English long, longbow is really the Welsh longbow. Right. And so Wales was not conquered until the mid to late 1200s. And so you didn't start seeing the English longbow like at Agincourt. Right. And th- I mean, that's why you started seeing it like during that time period because the Welsh were the ones using it and the English incorporated that. And then you had the English using it and things right. like that. And so, well, one, the English aren't down here. So definitely the Welsh aren't down here. But they're not using the longbow. They're using more, st- it's going to kind of look like a longbow, but right. smaller. A lot of wooden bows, you might just think, oh, longbow. It, well, when you have a single piece of wood, you kind of need it to be at least a certain length. Right, It right. doesn't necessarily mean it's the Welsh longbow. Right. It's just a wooden one-piece bow. Right. Well, my, and my, my point with all of that is that these composite bows are generally stronger than the, we'll just call them regular longbows. So they do have advantages compared to the European bows that they are using because the Europeans are, they're using, at the very least, they're using less composite recurve bows than the Turks and the you know every and the Seljuks and you know and and then later on you know all, all of the that army that that's composited with uh, the horse archer cultures and, and things like that. So they do have an advantage from the bow standpoint, in my opinion, and uh, as well as just being a bow culture. They, I mean, they sh- all they all grew up with it. It's like step one, learn to ride the horse. Right. Step two, learn to ride the horse while shooting a bow. Step three, like learn to walk. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of a extreme version but i mean that it's you grew up doing that right that you, you didn't grow up learning how to wear mail necessarily mm-hmm. but you all, you all grew up if you're a turkish boy you grew up shooting bows from horseback right so you were right. you were just good at it so the next thing we can talk a little bit about the siege equipment that you see in the movie because you see a ton of siege equipment right. that you don't see in a lot of movies other than like you know braveheart they have that whatever you call it battering ram that's oh, like yeah. You know, just ridiculously fantasy almost looking. They've got shields strapped to it. And, yeah. and I'm not saying they didn't do that. I'm just saying the way it looks. It's like a it's, log on wheels. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of, I mean, they did do things like that. But just the way that it looks is kind of hokey. Right, right. But uh, you see a ton, you see real battering rams right, right. in Kingdom of Heaven. You see like what Siege Towers siege actually look, actually look like. And, yeah. So, yeah, in, in Siege Warfare, uh, it's interesting in, in the Crusades because pitch battles, I mean, they certainly happen in the Crusades. But... In, in Europe, where a lot of the Crusaders came from, most fighting was raids or castle sieges. Mm. There were pitched battles, but they weren't always super common. I mean, there's a point where France went 100 full years as a nation without a major pitched battle. But tons of warfare. Oh, it's because it's raids and castles. But what's interesting is that the fighting in the Crusades, which maybe wasn't quite as siege-centric, you see a lot of advancements in siege warfare and one of them is the trebuchet which mm-hmm. we all love seeing trebuchets because they look so cool remember right. you see them in the Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. you see them in uh, that terrible made for TV until the Hun movie with Gerard Butler yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you see them in Kingdom of Heaven yeah. and uh, and there's just something about them they just look cool they're, they're cool they're just cooler than a regular catapult I don't yes. know why they just are mm-hmm. well that was developed I'm not sure which side but that came out of sieges in specifically the Crusades so that popped up in the Middle East before that popped up in Europe, where it was taken back by Crusaders. Right. Well, then, then you see them pick, because when Edward the First, like Longshanks, is conquering Scotland, right. he does build that massive, right. massive so trebuchet, the biggest one ever made. Well, yeah, and he was so, he, he was so giddy about it. The castle tried to surrender, and he said, "Not, not until no, we use it. Not until yeah. we've used my trebuchet on you. <laughs> then, then you can surrender." Um, and then, yeah, you see ladders, and you see uh, you see battering rams, which are things you could see in any siege anywhere in the world. Um, one thing you kind of see in the movie that's always debated is boiling oil and fire. And this is the days <clears> before <throat> Exxon. Yeah, so we aren't drilling. No one's drilling for oil. So oil would have been Oil's rare. precious. Right, it had been rare and worth a lot of money. And you'd use it to like light your churches and your homes and it, things like that. It's like candle wick light. Right. Like, that's what they use oil for. So... One, there's debates of like, would, would these uh, would these siege garrisons, would they even have deposits of oil that they're going to use in large enough amounts? And two, they always conveniently light stuff on fire with it. It's probably not quite as easy to light things on fire in the heat of a battle as movies make it look. But also what, what historians always say is, why would you waste precious oil when you could just dump hot water on yeah, them? boiling and water does boiling, the same thing. Yeah, you dump them boiling water on soldiers. Yeah, maybe, And then when they flee, you go out and you can destroy their ramp. And yeah. same with, like, they're, at one point they're throwing, like, pot grenades that right, have right. fire. Right, incendiary devices. Right, and Hollywood like that. loves fire. There's 
so I mean, few accounts of like guys throwing fire at yeah, each or, other. Or fire arrows. Or, oh, you know, fire arrows, which do not work. Unless yeah. you were firing at like a village with thatched roofs or hay roofs, armies didn't use flaming arrows because it just it changes the dynamics of the arrow. It doesn't yes. fly as far or as, or as powerfully. And you know, we've all tried to start fires in our fireplaces. We didn't just throw a flaming dart at the wood right. and suddenly you had a fire, right? Like, if you did that, you could just stomp on it real quick, mm-hmm. you know, if it didn't just burn itself out. So fire is kind of a, I won't say it's a Hollywood invention, because it, it, but it's it, pretty close it, it in, pretty, in siege yeah. warfare and in battles, you know, fire is just not a very viable, it's finicky. If you ever get a fire big enough and dangerous, it's probably just as much of a danger to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And so You're you also might see trying, in maybe in naval battles. The city but, is the prize. You don't want to destroy <laughs> the city. Right, yeah. yeah, you don't want to burn everything on fire. Yeah. So the <coughs> the me. other um what the other thing I was like boiling water and then also like animal fat. So they would dump animal fat onto right. a thing and then they would like they wouldn't use a flaming arrow, they would use like a torch and like drop it on. Right. It. You know, so like there are ways that they did use fire to set things ablaze and things like that. But it's not oil. Like right. there's not just like where do you get it? Where do you get pots and pots and pots of black oil? Right. Like, and and then another thing you uh you don't see it too much in movies, but um they always show these sometimes movies will have these fanciful mechanical inventions for that the defenders are using from the walls, which did happen and there's some very famous instances throughout history where someone created these crazy engines oh, of war. Yeah, that's like Roman times. Right, like Archimedes and right. Syracuse. But, right. Um, a lot of times movies will have these super intricate devices that essentially drop something heavy. And it's like guys could just drop rocks. Oh, yeah. yeah they, they, no one ever does they, that in movies. But, a rock the size of a bowling ball being dropped from 20 feet above you right. and landing on your head, it kill, that kills you. Yeah, and that we know that happened all the time. And you almost almost never in movies do you see people just dropping rocks. The, the Rohirrim? At yeah, Lord, Lord of the Rings again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing you would use fire for, and again, not very often is it found in movies, although you did mention during the Siege of Jerusalem that the Muslim army used this to kind of crumble part of the wall, is they would mine. Right. And, and they, would, they would dig under a wall, and as they removed dirt, you would place up wooden boards mm-hmm. to support the weight of the wall for where the dirt you removed. And then once you were good and ready you would light all that wood on fire so that it would crumble at once and cause the wall above you to, to right. fall apart. So they, they call it mining, not because they're placing bombs, right. you know, Helm's Deep style, <laughs> right. underneath the wall. They are making a mine. Right, they're digging a shaft. They're digging a shaft. To yeah. a point under the wall. So yeah. that that's kind of... The, I, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, another Hollywood trope is the Siege Tower. Historically speaking, siege towers, one, they're precious. Two, there's never that many of right, them. There's never 30 siege towers. There's never towers. 30 of them. Siege towers are not big ladders. Siege towers are a thing to get your archers and things like that higher than the walls of the castle or fortification that you are assaulting. So you would build a siege tower, and then you would get your men up in it, and you would push it close, and then you could fire down on top of the guys on the wall. Right. Because, like... Like you said, it's like, why would you use oil when water's free and you can just right. boil it? Why would you build this massive, massive siege tower when ladders are so much cheaper and easier? And right. if you can do something to get the ladders up, you can get more people up a ladder than, yeah. you know, the... And, and in the rare case where you do see a tower like that, it's a, it's a really big deal. Like, I mean, I, I think... The, I'm, I'm not saying they never did it, but right. I'm saying generally speaking... It'll, but the, the account would be like, they built one tower. Yes. And they spent, it took them a long time, but they finally got it in place mm-hmm. and then it might take them like another day to sort of like assault with yeah. the tower they're not just walking up right like there's it. there was there's not sieges where you see like on, on the horizon like siege like towers Star Wars with the with the walkers coming yeah, yeah. when it's all siege yeah, towers yeah, that's, <laughs> right you don't ever see that yeah i think i mean that pretty much covers siege yeah. they, they get some right they get some wrong in right. the movie but now we'll move on to armor and we did talk about this during the the main podcast is that they are all wearing mail and they are wearing a ton of it. I was reading this. It said it's something like the, the full suit. So not just like a breast thing or not just the full suit of male that they're wearing. It's leggings. It's arms. It's the coif. It's the headpiece. It's the, you know, everything. It's somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 links of iron. You know, a thousand man hours for a thing. So like the male of today is like the like uh jousting armor of the late medieval you know they're into the renaissance thing like people that are wearing that much mail are the nobility mm-hmm. you know or the 
night knightly class, you know, whether it's crusader or Muslim, like you know, their their knightly classes and nobility and, and things like that. It's just and they're wearing things underneath it. It's not like a naked body and then just metal. Right. But it's all male. There is other than their helmets, which we'll get to in a second, there is no there is no plated armor yet. Right. In other parts of the world you might see wealthy people wearing a nice scale. Mm. You might see I don't know if Byzantines had kind of lamellar type thing, or not lamellar, but where you have the little bits of plate yeah, you, I mean, attached I, to cloth. Y- yes, but not the Crusaders. No. no, they're just wearing. Ma- so I mean, we're not saying no other armor exists, right? But, right. But this is the armor of the day that the heavily armored knights on both sides. Yeah, on both sides are wearing. You don't see any kind of Roman thing, or again, you see in Hollywood, someone be wearing mail, but then they'll have these wonderful plated shoulders. Right. No. Right. Like, <laughs> no one's doing that. Yeah. You wouldn't see any like gauntlets. You wouldn't see any right. sh- even like the shin, like the shins, you know, because like in ancient Greek times they're wearing leggy like full metal, right? Yeah, like bronze, know, bronze uh, shin guards. Basically. Yeah, ba- bronze shin guards. Like yeah, they don't have that. They're not doing that with iron. They're not doing that with, with you know bronze or anything. Right. They're it's wearing, all male. They're wearing boots, and their their male is going at least to their knees. You know, to yeah. kind of cover them all up. Yeah, I mean, I just the. Male, I think, I've just always thought male looks cool. Mm-hmm. It does. It looks neat. And in the later period movies, when they're just wearing armor, they're going to have male under that as well. Right. And I always judge a movie like how accurate their armor is. If they're if they're not wearing male underneath their armor, I'm always like, okay, that's a knock against right. it. You know? Right. Because it, and it was always always in conjunction and always a progression. No one, <laughs> no one ever got like memos or right. an email like hey everyone we're going from this armor to right. this armor it's, it was it, it's not like the u.s armor like all right guys uh the, you know turn in this helmet and get your new helmet like right. we, like they do today it's like it's just i talked about it kind of in the the 300 episode where like you would see corinthian helmets but you would see you know more open face like yeah it, someone's got granddad's helmet yeah, you know out there. It, it, <laughs> so, exactly yeah, yeah, and it's the same it. way here like people have different variations of male different variations of this and things like that but, I mean, that pretty much covers covers me. I, mean, I just think it's really cool. But we move on to the helmets now for the armor. And during this time period, which we just talked about, it emphasizes that you're going to see three main helmets for the Crusaders. And that's the conical, the kettle, and the great helm. And these are those progressions of helmets. Yep. But you would still see all three of them. It's not like they're like, you know. they weren't like, hey, guys, we're no longer wearing the conical. We're all switching to kettle. You know, <laughs> <Right>. like... <laughs> Which, by the way, the movie, I think, does a very good job of showing these helmets. Yes, that you see all of them. Yep, you see all of them. So, uh, Balian, who is, you know, Orlando Bloom's character, he is wearing that Norman-esque conical helmet. And during this time period, they would all, more or less, almost all have a, some type of nose guard right. co- coming coming down. and But it's basically just like a cone head. Right. It's, like, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a metal cone head with a, with a nasal piece. Right. It's not that far off of what you would see late Roman and sort of migration barbarian era people right. wearing. I mean, it's, it's a little different. I but, call it the Norman helmet because right. like any anytime you see any type of Norman drawings like the tapestry, they are wearing these conical helmets right. with the nasal with the nasal piece. Right. Every helmet you see in uh, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves, all wearing. They're yeah. all wearing the conical right. nasal piece. And it's it's nothing more than a slight difference of what you saw hundreds of years before. It's it's like the last step before helmets started getting kind of knightly and, right. and intricate looking. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. The next one you're going to see is the kettle helmet, which looks more or less like the World War One British helmet um, that you see. I mean, that's the way I would describe it. I always think it's extremely British looking to me. <laughs> one, because that helmet looks like the World War One British helmet. And two, because in that really bad Joan of Arc movie, The Messenger, oh, yeah. the, all of the the British all wear kettle helmets, and then the French all wear like other type right. of other type of helmets, like them identifying the different. Yeah, I also feel like you saw it with lots of like toys or in Disney movies, all of our Playmobil guys, yeah. and everyone's always British, you know. Yes. And, and so if it's if it's medieval Europe, even if it's supposed to be in France, they give everyone English accents, mm-hmm. and so yeah, that's that's where you see it is on English people yep. all the time. But yeah, like I said, it, I mean it's. It's basically the conical helmet, but it has a visor, yep. a, a wide brim that goes around the helmet. And they did this for a multitude of reasons. It, you really see the kettle helmet form in, excuse me, in the Holy Land during these Crusader states for two reasons. One, because they're always getting pelted with arrows, and it's nice to have a little bit more of a brim when they're coming down on top of you. And two, for shade. <laughs> like they are getting hot and having any type of shade on your face and everything like that like just having the shadow of your helmet over your shoulders allows the male 
to not <laughs> scald you. Right, right. You know, so, and, and I, I always like that because, like, that's a very non-battle function thing that has right. a big impact on how you can fight. Right. Hey, I want some shade, you know? <laughs> it also shows the prevalence of European crusades of siege warfare, which movies love pitch battles. In, in a world where all the knights seem to, like, cover more and more of their bodies and faces, you know, why would you have open-faced helmets like the, like like these kettle helms, like wide brims and open face? Because mm -hmm. if you're attacking a castle, where does everything come? It comes from above. Right. And so these wide brims protect you, even though your face is open. Right. And that that wouldn't develop in a world where siege warfare wasn't, wasn't super prevalent. prevalent. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, ne the next big one you see is the great helm, and you really see it on the Teutonic... Uh, you know, <laughs> assassins. Yeah, the Teutonic <laughs> assassins that come to kill Orlando Bloom at his palm tree. Um, <laughs> and it is... The first real step towards the late medieval Renaissance, great helms, right. jousting knights, full coverage, full coverage eye slits, and it really is how they made it. Is they now there's a couple of different ways you can make it, but they basically just like take the frame of the conical and then right. have a have a sheet that comes down around it, and they've cut some breathing holes or drilled or you know hammered uh, some breathing holes into it, and then eye slits, right. And the famous one you'll see is like the cross piece that keeps it all together is like highlighted as a cross. Right. right. And this just offers you greater protection, right. you know, and, but at the same time, it's also going to be hotter. It's going to be, you lose your, just like with vision. any helmet, you lose your vision and your peripheral. Yeah. Which yeah. some knights hate it. That's again, that's why you would see a conical mm -hmm. when someone else had a great helm. The guy who grew up with the conical, He's more he, comfortable with Right. It. If he didn't grow up with the great helm, he'd be like, why Why would I wear something I can't see out of? Mm -hmm. You know, later on down the line when everyone's had it, that's right. normal. But for him, maybe not. Yeah. And you, know, you just see, you see these intertwined mm -hmm. and all, you know, it's like, yeah, it's not just cut and dry. Right. And so it was really great in the movie to see all of these things represented. You also saw the the visor. Yeah. That, that early visor. Early yeah. visor that, that came down right. during that Calvary charge, yeah. which I loved as well because... One, we know that those were real. Right. And two, even in today's army, you can somewhat customize your stuff, right? And wear it how you want. Put this over here. Put this over there. I mean, like it would not be it would not be out of the realm of possibility that a knight just decides, like, you know what? I want a visor. And so he had enough money, and he got some blacksmith to like put on a visor to his right. conical or what you know what, right. what, whatever it was so i just thought that was really cool yeah and it's it is neat that if you look closely you see god you know we have the conical and there's the the great helm and even the jump between that was gradual and you'll see these guys that have helmets kind of like liam neeson's helmet mm -hmm. it's like it's not conical shaped it's kind of round but it's essentially still just to sit yes, on yes, top yeah, of yeah, his yeah. head right it's like it's something like that almost a conical helmet and then like just a face shield that hangs down in front of it mm -hmm. maybe visor maybe not and it, it just sort of just sticks down. And so your ears and neck are all exposed, but the top of your head and your face is covered. Well, from that, they, they gradually extended more that more metal more, right? more and more around the head, and you get the great helm. And it's cool that you, you can even find guys in the background wearing mm -hmm. those versions of helmets like that. Right. The, the one thing I do hit the movie a little hard for individually is during that cavalry charge, when Orlando Bloom gets knocked off his horse and he, he loses his helmet, which he probably would because it would be they're all strapped everything on. is strapped on. But he goes down, he pops back up, and what's the first thing he does? He kicks off his, he, yeah, his yeah. male head cover. Yes, exactly. Like the, the coif is undone, hanging down. It would be tied up, which at the start, it is tied up. Right. I and mean, that's correct. And in the final battle on the, uh, where the crumbled wall, mm -hmm. he keeps his helmet on the whole time. The whole time. Yeah, he does yeah. throw away his shield. Right. But, which... <laughs> yeah, people didn't want to get rid of their armor. Right. You, 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 didn't, you didn't kick off your helmet, shake out your locks, right. wink at the camera and charge. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> you wanted to... For Frodo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you really wanted to stay protected. That was the whole point of armor. Yeah. Otherwise, why wear the 80 pounds or whatever? Yeah, exactly. If you're not going to use it, why wear it? Just be, you're just slow, tired, and hot now. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and I know why... The, this is... Any war movie ever where people are wearing any type of helmet from World War II to Roman to whatever, they want to see the stars' faces. Yes. And I and I get that, right? I, I understand that from the movie-making standpoint, but I'm still going to hit you for it. Right. E even the, the last duel, where they, they have some of the most accurate medieval armor yeah. ever with... Uh, Oh, what's with uh, Matt, Matt Damon and uh, Adam Driver? Adam Driver, yeah. Except they cut half the visor out of each of their helmets. Yeah, just which there's 
that Zero. never existed yeah. ever. And it's just so you can see, like, oh, Matt Damon's face. Yeah, we yeah. paid this guy a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. There's... Well, if I was Matt Damon, I'd be like, you're paying me a lot of money. Cut out. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of what they're wearing, pretty darn accurate. Yes, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. they just Hollywood. Of course, loves... that's late. That's late. Yeah, yeah, totally different era. But Hollywood just loves to see their stars' mm-hmm. faces. That's what it is. Well, I mean, like I was like, hey, if I'm paying you a lot of money, they're gonna see your face because you're what's bringing the tickets in. <laughs> right. So I get it. I'm like I said, I'm still gonna hit you historically for it, but I understand. Moving on, we'll, we're just gonna hit it real quick. Is the shields that you see in the movie because you do see a lot of different shields. Yep. And one of the cool ones that you see is the kite shield in the movie. That's Crusaders. A lot of them are carrying it. You see it when they march up to Karak right. and everything like Another that. Another kind of Norman thing you see in Norman art. They mm-hmm. want those kite shields. Yep. I mean, it's. It's the evolution of the shield wall, right? So right. the shield wall, I mean, depending on how you want to look at it, the shield wall goes all the way back to Greek and, you know, all of that. But the Norman shield wall is the development of the Viking shield wall with the round shield holding strong and marching and, and, and looking for weaknesses in the other formation, whether that be the flank or th- things of that nature. And the kite shield just became the next step in the evolution of the Norman Western Europeans shield wall. And this time you're seeing it as basically the anvil and the heavy cavalry as the hammer. Right. And you, you've got your archers and your spearmen behind these big heavy kite shields and they can maneuver a little bit and then they can exploit something. And once they've got it, the cavalry will come in and bust through the lines or even sometimes vice versa, right? The cavalry will bust through a line and then you can march your, your shield wall into it to exploit that gap as, as well but that you know, I mean you see round shields you see, you know the the muslim forces have their kind of rounder lighter shields and with the, kind of like that central knob on them and things like that but the the, the kite shield is really the famous right the famous crusader shield right. and it gives you a little leg protection yeah as compared to like a viking era round shield right yeah, right, right so much one thing i thought was really cool about the shields in the movie and i i wondered about this for a long time was they all had matching indentations on the front mm-hmm. of them, and I thought, is this like their like, like fake cheap, fake battle damage? Because yeah. they all look like identical. The, the art department was just getting lazy, right? <laughs> and it, it, it turns out those are essentially like nails that used to combine layers of you know, wood or leather, mm-hmm. or whatever the shield is. That it kind of it's layered on itself in the probably not bolts, but the nails that sort of hammered in would have all been relatively uniform in those yeah, spots. Yeah. So I That's thought cool. that was actually... So it's actually cool. not a movie mistake. It's actually yeah, pretty correct, accurate. Correct. <laughs> yeah, it's not fake battle damage. <laughs> so then we'll move on to the tactics real quick. And we're not going to get into deep, deep tactics, but I do want to talk about a few of the little tactics. And when you look at the Crusaders... Sorry, I said that's kind of weird. When you, when you look at the Crusaders, you're really looking at bold moves. They do not have the, the, the force... Especially after the First Crusade. Like Mark said, they've always got a manpower shortage, right? So they cannot just go out and conquer. They have to make a bold move to a, a specific strategic point. Take it, destroy it, or build a new castle after they take it, or you know so, something along those lines. They are not a Alexander the Great moving through the Persian Empire, conquering everything force. And so you really see them in like quick, short-distance, bold moves is what they're really going to focus on and, and it worked for a few hundred years they held that entire coastline being able to strike out from their castles make a bold move that would have an impact on the saracen forces and then they go back to their castles and the whole I, first crusade is like a series of hail marys yeah, yeah. <laughs> that all works somehow. yeah it's crazy it's crazy and then the but we, and we talked a little bit about this before so we won't spend too too long on it but the frankish charge and just how impactful and effective the 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 heavy cavalry charge of the crusaders was against other forces whether that be the egyptian forces at the beginning or even when they are initially coming into contact with the seljuks or later on when they're up against saladin and, and his combined forces and, and things like that and mark said earlier the crusaders one did not respect the egyptians whatsoever they did respect the seljuks and then later on you know the uh, uh, yeah, Ayub- yeah. Ayubids. Um, Still using Turkish horse archer armies, right? But, and I, I was just gonna say, I say again, like it, the power of a heavy cavalry charge cannot be understated or cannot be overstated almost enough, unless you get to the Rohirrim charging through the works. <laughs> yeah. like, once you get there, you're you're jumping the shark a little bit. But these, I mean, I you know I've worked with horses for years 
and I have never been involved, obviously, in a charge like that. But, like, we've called the herd in for feeding and things like that. You can feel the ground shake when there's just 30 or 40 horses running running in. And when you're on a horse and you're running, you can feel the power of this horse. It's intimidating. It's extremely intimidating. I mean, there, that's why that's why armies flee before the, the charge even right. gets there, right? You know, right. Like, that's why European armies wanted their peasants and archers to hang out in the back. And just let them sort it out. We yeah. Just not, I mean, yeah, we brought a whole army. We don't really need y'all, but you know, <laughs> let's, we're just going to do this our way. Yeah. I mean, the the Frank the, from the even when it failed, it was still effective and intimidating and powerful. Like the horns of a team, they are doing the Frankish, you know, charge over and over and over again, and it's basically what's saving the army until right. they finally do get overwhelmed. And then you go, so we go back to that movie scene again, and. It is a flip of a coin, or maybe even more in the Crusaders' favor, that that heavy cavalry charge takes out, or at least scatters, right. that the you know the, the light cavalry charge. Or 200 charge. man, man yeah. guard, or whatever. And like, if there were horse archers, it would be fighting differently in the odds, and we would talk right. about it differently. But in the movie, they don't, they're not, they don't have archers. No. It's just light cavalry with short spears. And that Frankish charge would at least stall their charge, and they could scatter them off. Right. And, and some of it was his persona, but... The, and you can you always got to take medieval chronicles with a grain of salt. There's like accounts when once Richard Lionheart arrives in the Middle East and he's won a battle here and there, and he kind of has built her his persona. Like you know, a group of thirty or forty Muslim horse archers sort of like take off and flee when they see him come over the hill. Mm -hmm. Some of that because like oh it's Richard, but right. I mean they they learn to respect again. Not, not that they couldn't beat it because they did beat it in lots of battles. Right, right. There was ways to beat the charge, but everyone respected that. Everyone knew you didn't want to. You didn't want to take the brunt of the mm -hmm. charge. If you want, if you wanted to beat it, you had to do other things. To right. Beat it. And or like you were saying in the last episode, like the Saladin and the you know the Ayyubid dynasty did not really respect the Crusaders in culture and in like science and in nope. any like certainly even not in, religion. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, certainly not religion, but even in their military capabilities. But they respected the heavy cavalry. Right. Right. Yeah, like a, a Western European fully armored. So, Really rough thing to have to fight. Yeah. You know, I mean, everything else we got you on, but you're you're terrified it's, when you charge. And, and the thing is, the throughout history, yes, the Eastern you know uh, empires had heavy cavalry. It's something that the West has always just been good at. Right. Right. Heavy, whether that be heavy infantry or heavy cavalry, it's just. Right. I'm not, I don't want to get into like a clash of cultures type of thing, but it really is. Like, right. what what does the East do really good about? Like horse archers and run and hit, hit and run tactics and th you know things of that yeah. nature. What is the West to? Hey, if they get a hold of you, like they're gonna brutally beat you right. down, right? And it, I think it has a lot to do with geography. I mean, even you look at Roman times. What, what did what did all the we'll call them the barbarian tribes? What, what were they known for? Not even necessarily cavalry, but their their army, even if it was infantry based, it charged. That's mm -hmm. what it had. It, it charged. It ran in and tried to smash into you. Yeah, you know, like I said, in the Middle East and Asia, it's always there's a little bit more space, a little bit more maneuvering, more emphasis on archers and so, not to say right. that if you if you never took, archers in the West you, and never heavy infantry in the East. But, right, right, right. But just, but just generally speaking, yeah. Like if you took the Saracen Muslim Seljuk culture and you put that in Western Europe and you took the Western Christian, you know, culture and put it in the Middle East, the Seljuks would probably be heavy cavalry. Right. Over the, time, yeah. Over time, yeah. they would become heavy and. And you, when you see the, in the late medieval era, when when some of these knightly charges seem to like struggle a lot more with, mm -hmm. with the Ottoman Turks, well, the Ottomans created a professional full time infantry force called the Janissaries. They could handle that stuff a little, mm -hmm. and also their Sapahi cavalry became heavier. Right? I mean, it was they had to create heavy infantry to kind of deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and they and a lot of their empires straddled Europe and Asia. It right. wasn't like they it's were a mix all, of culture. Right? They weren't in Iran. They were in the Balkans as much right. as they were Turkey, and so. Yeah, the, the Middle East, these, but where, where there's wide open spaces and it's cavalry dominated, you tend to have a little bit more maneuverable maneuverability focus in your. Yeah, arms. same thing in the Americas, right? You look at the Comanche and the Sioux; they're right. mobile horse archers. Well, they go and if they're they're fighting people on the peripherals like the you know Pawnee and things like that, they're not horse archers, right? right? Because they're not in the in the midst of the Great Plains. Right. Um, you know, now we move on to the Muslim tactics. Like, I mean, there's not a whole whole lot to like dive into about it because we've already kind of covered it just the fact by, of talking of the crusaders tactics but they are geared more towards conquest uh, than the bold move so they do sweep through they do go from castle to castle to town to town more methodically 
than the Crusader forces did during the First Crusade or the way they defended the Kingdom of Jerusalem and things of that nature because their goal is to reconquer their land. And so they're going to systematically, like a wave, you know, kind of. But at the same time, they're not slow. They're, the mo they're a mobile, they're a very highly mobile army because of the horse archer that we've been talking about. And one of the things that the, we kind of ended on, the horse archer has culture has always relied on the feigned retreat. Now, there are Western armies that do feigned retreats, and, well, you could debate whether the Conqueror's feigned retreat is actually a feigned retreat. But the horse archers are, that's what one of the things they're known for. I mean, the Mongols, time and time again. Right. There, there's, there has to be something in the psyche of the human mind that when you see somebody fleeing... You want to chase them to, right. you know, build upon your victory. Because we all know that the retreat is where most of the casualties happen most of the time. And so when you see them fleeing, you're like, now it's time to seal the victory. Right, right. And they just capitalize on that. And time and time again, Western armies follow the feigned retreat. And then before you know it, they're surrounded. And right. the feigned retreat varies on scale. Because, like, the horns of a teen is not really a feigned retreat. But they are following the horse archers that are harassing them. Right. And then trying to get away from them and trying to maneuver. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's the actual force, right? right? They're, they're not, yeah, there's a long distance they're trying to cover. Mm -hmm. And they're being attacked while they're doing it. Which is basically what's going on with the feigned retreat. Right. You're just trying to stretch them out. Again, you need space for it. Right. You're creating space. And as they cross that space, you harass them until it breaks up their attack. Yeah, or or your main attack is in position in the right position and right. things of that nature. And I mean, really, the Fane Retreat comes into its prominence with the Mongols. Right. They do it over and over and over again. And, and no, no one ever really seems no. to catch on. <laughs> Even cultures that figured it out and put it in writing. Don't chase after the horse, Mongols. You know, Central Asian horse archers because it's not a real retreat. Right. And like the next pitch battle, they chase after them and right. get surrounded. Not this time. This time it's a real retreat. Right. Yeah. Because you had some, like the Byzantines, who over centuries faced multiple horse archer cultures. Mm -hmm. They had it in their manuals. Like, Watch out for the feigned retreat. Like yeah. it's not always. It's usually not real. And mm -hmm. there's and and what's interesting about the feigned retreat too is it's really hard for most armies to do feigned retreats. Right. But for some reason, the Central Asian horse archers it's like they were literally born with a six you know sense of how how to gauge you know when to fall back and when right. not to. Yeah, exactly. If you but other armies would try it, and it would lead to an actual retreat because yeah. they can't do it right. I was like, it's it's hard to gauge when how far to be engaged. So that you can still break right. the right way. Because if you get too much, that's the battle, right? You, you can't just all of a sudden be like, yeah. now it's time to do the fade retreat, guys. Right. Like, well, how, how do you keep coordination? I mean, some of these battles where you have large columns that get strung out over miles and miles, mm -hmm. there might be guys doing a fake retreat, and they might be out of sight from the right. from the force you have that's kind of pinning their main force while you try to draw out the knights, right? Like, So the, in, order, in order to keep command and control over that is incredible, but... They just had an ability to do it. Yeah. They just could. Well, I mean, when you when you grow up on the horse and you grow up doing that stuff, it it becomes a sixth sense like that. Just like the Frankish charge was like, hey, you know what we do? We mount up and we we go right. hard, right? right? You know, like the especially during this time, the Muslim forces never had some type of heavy infantry that could smash a line. Right. Right. Um, yeah. No, they just had this ability to. to executed over long distances mm -hmm. over time and time again and, and it a lot of time I mean, it ultimately worked right I mean, ultimately mm -hmm. the crusades failed the, right the, some of that's a numbers thing and a logistics thing but a lot I mean there were plenty of there, there are other battles. factors but it's definitely yeah right I mean the the biggest battle we talked about in the horns of a team the Muslims they, they win with it mm -hmm. right despite these charges so it obviously did did it work. is effective right right one, one tactic we do see from the crusades and again commanding control is very difficult you also the knightly in the medieval knightly world you get a lot of strong-headed people not always wanting to listen to mm -hmm, who's in mm -hmm. charge but the battles and we, we saw Baldwin IV use this once um, Richard Leinhardt famously used it um, and by the time he, Richard arrived crossbows were just becoming yeah. a very common thing he used lots of crossbows in his army um, what you would do it with, with the Crusaders if you had the command and control and the discipline you would have a heavy infantry force supported by by foot archers or crossbowmen and the whole point of the archers and crossbowmen was they keep those horse archers kind of away mm -hmm. right if they come too close we'll shoot at them if if they come through the arrows well then you got a spear wall to keep them and you just keep that cohesion and you slowly march your whole army against them until you kind of push them against a natural barrier like a mountain or a lake a river or, or something yeah, yeah. And, and and then either they either flee and take off because they can't do anything to your strong formation or you get close enough that your knights 
do charge, break up their formation, hopefully don't get caught in a faint retreat, yeah. <laughs> and, and you chase them off. Um, I, I'm going to say it wrong, but I believe it's Angelou, is, is Richard's famous victory where his column, it's like a big rectangle shape of infantry and archers up with the sea on one side, horse archers on the other, and they keep them at bay until that finally they, they get kind of too close and all the knights, they don't really listen to Richard, they charge piecemeal, but it has the same effect. They all charge and chase them off. And that's where you see the Crusaders at the best, whereas ironically, that you got this strong Frankish charge tactic. It was at its best when it was used in conjunction with right. heavy infantry. Right. The problem is this is the medieval times. You don't have professional armies, and so right. Right. it doesn't always work like you want. A lot of times the knights just charge off and get yeah, caught. Is, is the, the one thing about the Crusaders is like they always kind of have like a piecemeal, haphazard feel about them, but it's really just kind of hit or miss because sometimes they're extremely coordinated right. and it works perfectly. And other times, like the Horns of Tina is like, Man, were they even trying? Right. Yeah, you know, and then they just you know, they fall into... Right, it's like, was this noble... Was this goal to lose the battle? Because right. he did just about everything he could to right. lose it. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that pretty much wraps up what we were talking about. Like I said, we want to... These ones don't want to get too, too long. But um, that kind of covers it for Kingdom of Heaven, weapons, armor, and tactics. And I hope, you know, further down the line, we'll get another movie. Um, and we can, we can do this again, because I really... Really enjoyed uh, yeah, it was, doing, doing it with you. It was fun. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. And thanks again, everybody supporting us and follow, spread the word, uh, help us keep the podcast going, and we will see you next time on the Based on History podcast. Adios.